Let's look at ionic bonding and um, uh, just a quick introduction to it, and then we'll look at um, uh, some of the, issue, the some of the things involved with ionic bonding. Um, uh, ionic bonding involves a, a, a metal with a low ionization energy. And a nonmetal with a high electron affinity. Okay, and what we're what we're looking for here is the transfer of electrons that are going to happen. So let's look at the periodic table just briefly. Recall metallic character increases as you go over and down. So what we're and, and so so we have we have uh, for for mostly nonmetals up here in this corner of the periodic table, and things that are very metallic over here. And so what we'll see with ionic bonding is ionic bonding is going to involve some a, a, a metal. And recall, metals have low ionization energies. It is easy to make them a positive ion, right? They'd like to be positive ions. Low ionization energy, meaning you'd like to be positive ion, with something that has a high electron affinity. Something up here, which likes to be a negative ion, right? Electron affinity is, is essentially the creation of a negative ion in the gas phase. So what we're looking at is something over here reacting giving up its electron to something over here that wants an electron or two or more to be able to make a compound. So metals, low ionization energy and non-metals of high electron affinity. So things from the, when things from this side of the periodic table bind with things from this side of the periodic table, we have ionic bonding happening. Here's an example of, of what, we might, what we might see. Um, and then let's look at it uh, Let's look at it from the perspective of the of the orbital, or sorry, the the, the um, electronic diagrams. So one s two, two s two, two p six, three s one is sodium, right? And for chlorine, one s two, two s two. 2p6, 3s2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3s5. Okay, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s5. You should by this point be able to give me the electronic configuration of any um, uh, of, of any element very quickly, and, and so this should not be a difficult for you. If it's if it is difficult, um, please go and um, practice some more. Well, let's look at what happens when, when, when we have ionic bonding happening. So when we have ionic bonding happening, what happens is um, we are taking one electron from the sodium and essentially giving it to the chlorine. And note what happens when that, when, note what occurs when that happens. We retain the noble gas, or we have, sorry, I have uh, something wrong here. I just realized this would be 3s2, 3p5, right? I, I apologize. Okay, so 3s2, 3s1. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking this uh, 3s electron from the sodium and we're going to give it to the chlorine and it will put it into the, um, it will put it into the p orbital that's free. Three P six. So what we have here, this is the electronic configuration of sodium plus, and the electronic configuration of Cl minus. And so you can see what's happened is now both of these things have a noble gas configuration, right? Sodium losing one electron and becoming isoelectronic with neon. 
same electron configuration as neon, 2s2, 2p6. Aha. Chlorine gaining an electron and then it being isoelectronic with, so chlorine's here, gains one electron, it becomes isoelectronic with argon. Okay, so we have Na plus and Cl minus and and okay. Um, now there's, oh, okay, so th there's one thing I want to introduce here. Rather than writing out these electron formulas all the time to be able to see what's happening with the valence electrons, I'm going to introduce this idea of something called a Lewis dot structure. Which makes it a little more convenient to think about the electronic configuration of atoms and ions. And with a Lewis dot structure, the element represents the nucleus and dots will represent the valence electrons. So the element represents the nucleus and the dots represent electrons. Here's an example. Let's think about lithium. Lithium is right here. How many valence electrons does lithium have? Well, it has one valence electron in the 2s. So we would draw one dot around it. Let's think about nitrogen. How many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Well, one, two, three, four, five. We just count over, and that will give us the number of valence electrons. And I'm going to put five dots around nitrogen, and that would be the Lewis dot structure of the nitrogen atom. Um, we can do the same thing, for example, for fluorine. Fluorine is here. Count over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The group number also gives you the number of electrons. So this would be group 7a, and that would be seven valence electrons. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is a Lewis dot structure for fluorine. For neon, we would have eight valence electrons around it, and so our Lewis dot structure would look like that. And you can see what the Lewis dot structure is doing for us, is it's essentially showing us the electrons that are here, that are present in the highest n value. The valence electrons, that's what these electrons are showing us. Okay, so we'll be using Lewis dot structures in, uh, a lot more in the future, but one thing I wanted to point out and to have a discussion of first is thinking about the electronic configurations of ions. And some of the electronic, uh, and some of the properties of an ion. Um, so, so, of course, if we have, just as an example, we just saw, for an example, if we have the calcium 2 plus ion, Let's see, let's, let's do the calcium 2 plus ion. If we have calcium 2 plus, it likes to lose two electrons and it will become isoelectronic with argon. Okay, so if that's the case, our electronic, oops, two, 2p comes before 3p, of course. Okay, we could write our, um, if we needed to, we could write a Lewis dot structure, something like this for an ion. This ion would have eight valence electrons, but we have to note that it's a plus two ion, and we would do that with brackets or something like that. If we were doing something for sulfur, we might do 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Same thing, we can put it in brackets and just remind ourselves that it does have eight valence electrons around it, but those are, um, this is a minus two ion. Okay, so uh, uh, one thing I want to point out here is, so, so, so we've already seen some of this briefly and, and uh, um, with the previous example, but I just want to, you should be able to give me the electronic configuration of an, of an ion. And, and part of the reason I want you to be able to do that or think about this is, is the um, ionic radius of ions. Okay, and so let's think about what, what's, so we looked at atomic radius and how that varies in the periodic table. Let's think about ionic radius. 
Okay. So, so what we're going to do is we'll measure the size of the spherical region around the nucleus and, and, and where electrons are likely to be found. Um, um, it's, it's going to, of course, um, depend on the nuclear charge, the number of electrons, and the valence uh, orbitals that are involved, how, what the ionic radius is. But always, this is something, is, and we'll see why this is the case in a moment, cations are smaller than parent atoms. A cation will always be smaller than its parent atom. An anion will always be larger than the parent atom. Okay. Ions of the same charge, the radii increase going down a group. Which, which makes sense. So for example, if we have beryllium plus two, magnesium plus two, calcium plus two, strontium plus two, those are going to increase in size as we go down a group, which, which, which is intuitive, right? Because we have uh, greater n values that are being, or greater yeah, n values that are essentially there. Okay, let's, let's look at at sort of why this is the case and, and why things uh, um, work this way. Okay, here's an example. Let's look at this idea that anions would be larger than their parent atoms. Okay, so sulfur or S2 minus which is larger and why? Okay, well, we already, I already have spilled the beans, so to speak, and told you that the anion is going to be larger than the parent ion. Okay, what's different about that? Well, if we have S2 minus, this ion has more electrons. There are more electron, electron repulsions within the shell that the electrons exist in, so the valence orbitals are a little bit larger. That's one way to think about it. Okay. Similar thing is to with cations. But the opposite effect. All right. Here's something that's a little challenging. For isoelectronic species, let's think about what happens with them. Oops, isoelectronic. How would we um, uh, um, expect or, or, or predict what the radii would be? Okay. so so. For isoelectronic species, what I mean by isoelectronic is the following. Let's, let's do this. Let's have an example of um, um, S2 minus or Cl minus, which is larger. Which of those two ions would be larger between these two? Okay, so for ice, so, so in this case, What's going to happen is the radii will decrease with increasing nuclear charge. Okay, so let's think about this as to why that would be. So we have, just to show you, so we have S2 minus and Cl2 minus. So we have two different species that have the same number of electrons as argon. Same number of electrons as argon, S2 minus and Cl minus. So we're isoelectronic with argon, 18, that means we have 18 electrons in each of these species. How many protons are in each of these? Ah, well, 
Sulfur has 16 protons. Chlorine would have 17 protons, just because that's what makes it sulfur or chlorine, right? The atom. Okay, so what's happening is the nuclear charge is going up, right? Between chlorine and sulfur. And so what's going to happen is we have the same number of electrons, though. Which of these is going to be able to, which of these two nuclei are going to be able to draw the electrons a little tighter in? Well, the chlorine would be able to because it has to draw in, um, it has to draw in the same number of electrons, but it has one more proton to do it with. So this would be the larger of the two. And indeed, the radius of this is known to be 184 picometers versus 181 picometers. Okay, so this is, and, and we'll, we'll look at, and we'll use this idea of how big uh, uh, ionic radii are to some extent when it comes to looking at the energetics of ionic bonding.